Well, Dr. Gundy, think you can beat that. <sighs> okay. <laughs> That looks like a tough act to follow. Good morning, everyone. Our speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Jeff Gundy, is here by invitation of the Menno Simons Lecture Series. And my understanding is you're speaking once more uh, at tonight at 7 in this room, probably again. So if you like what you hear this morning, you can come back for a second helping. Um, and speaking of second helpings, uh, Mark Jansen has asked me to invite you all to, well, not all of you, but those of you who are interested to join he and Dr. Gundy for lunch at the cafe after convocation this morning. Dr. Gundy has a BA in English from Goshen College, and he has an MA in Creative Writing and Poetry and a PhD in American Literature, both from Indiana University. He has taught for many years English at Bluffton University and has published six books of poems and four books of prose, some of which uh, he will share with us this morning. So please help me welcome Dr. Jeff Gundy. Well, thank you, uh, Annette, and it's great to be here. Uh, I've been to Bethel a number of times before. My son, Ben, graduated from this place in 2005. Uh, long ago before that, I uh, taught for four years at Heston College, just up the road, and so I feel it's, it's always good to get back to Kansas. Uh, my title today, as you can see from the slide, is Somewhere Near Defiance, and that is both uh, the name of a place uh, near where I live in Northwest Ohio. Uh, there's a town called Defiance, which I'll talk about a little more. Um, also, as you might uh, guess, the title seems to invite being read more than one way, and I want to sort of try to unpack uh, what it might mean to kind of live and write that way uh, in a place and a time and a culture which uh, is fascinating and rewarding in many ways, but also seems to deserve uh, some resistance at many points as well. So um, I want to start out with a poem that's uh, in this, this book, which is by that title. And it's a poem about my college days, really. It kind of starts even before that, growing up on a farm in Illinois. And uh, it has in it a number of references to uh, the music of Bob Dylan and especially to his uh, uh, transcendentally wonderful album, Blonde on Blonde. Uh, you know, Dylan fans in the audience, give me, uh, give, me, give me some love here. Okay, all right. Uh, so this is autobiography with Blonde on Blonde. The rag man drew circles on everything, but St. John dragged his feet through them all, saying, in the beginning was the word until time shuddered like a bus with bad breaks, and my dad rubbed his face and sat down at the kitchen table, his farmer tan glowing. It had been a windy day, and the brutal stench of Hillman's hogs wafted through the screens. I whacked Kathy, my sister, on the back of the head just to hear her howl. It worked. <laughs> then they drove me off to college, where I learned that the not yet has already happened if you squint at it just right. I am, I said, said Neil Diamond, and we had to agree with that. Then the president explained that those unwilling to kill for peace might once have been good people, but godless communist drugs had made them into trolls and orcs. We knew he was an idiot. We were elves and hobbits. <laughs> and decided to set off for Mordor to destroy the ring right after dinner. But somebody put on blonde on blonde again. And it was just like the night to play tricks, and we could hardly root out the fascist pigs while Louise and her lover were so entwined. We walked down beside the dam instead, tried to lose ourselves in the scant woods. I never got to Memphis or to Mobile. The hard rain was already falling, but the sun still shone like glory some of those afternoons with classes over and the long night ahead and water roaring down the spillway like the great I am. So I, I've got just a few slides here with a few quotes from uh, various people on them. And, and all of these poems uh, were written sort of in conversation 
with uh, various people, uh, some of whom have a kind of Bethel connection or a Kansas connection of various sorts. And so the next one, uh, here's Gordon Kaufman, eminent, eminent Mennonite theologian, uh, whom many of you will know about. Uh, he came to Bluffton not long before he died and did a, did a talk there. And uh, it was fascinating guy, and of course uh, he was he was somewhat controversial uh, for the sort of uh, austerity of his uh, theology, but but he said as as this says that God is the profound mystery of creativity, the ongoing creativity uh, in the universe, and uh, so this poem I'm going to read uh, really plays with some of his other ideas uh, about metaphor and and among many other things that he said, of course, uh, he, he was critical of the way that we take metaphors, we, we make metaphors for God, he said, and then we behave as though those metaphors are real, yeah, like, like God is really our father, uh, for instance. And so there's, there's some of that uh, in this poem, but it's also just kind of a meditative poem. Um, I was sitting on the shores of the, one of the quarries in Bluffton, as, as I wrote it, and this is called No Path. Kayak on the quarry, will you hug the shore, push straight across, waver or dawdle? No paths on the water. Almost November and the poison ivy is still green. The soft trap of sky closes all around, an artful little spray of leaves near the shore, as though Martha Stewart were sitting in for God. Give up all that father stuff, said Gordon. Look where it's got us. And the warrior, even worse. The kayakers lift and dip their paddles, orange signals, this way for us. So much is offered, so much goes begging, and still what we need evades us or hides in plain sight. On the water, every way might be the right way. God might be the father and the warrior and the lost leaves, the water and the bleached trunk, motion and stone, lush twists of cloud and barking dog and wind, star upon star, alert and invisible in every direction, low moan in the blood, circle and drift in the bright cells, shadowy hum and whir of electrons, fizz and buzz and shush too small to name. No end, no opening, no tribe, no answer. Only this, kayak and paddlers, lift and dip, breath and muscle above the chill water, below the soft sky. So as I was working on this book, I was also working on this uh, a, a prose book, book of essays called uh, Songs from an Empty Cage. And I was, I was reading sort of the the farthest out theologians I could find kind of along the way uh, with reading a lot of other things in this book. And I discovered this uh, fascinating uh, woman with Mennonite roots, an MB from Canada who ended up uh, in uh, England, teaching in England and becoming a Quaker uh, uh, named Grace Jansen. And she, she wrote a lot of really interesting things. Uh, this next poem, uh, do I, I don't think I have that. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, has it, it plays with some of the ideas in her book Violence to Eternity, which is largely about the uh, first books of the New Testament and the, the Yahweh who's depicted in there, who uh, Grace Jansen was somewhat uh, skeptical, to say the least. Uh, and so this is one of the things that she says about uh, those early books and the, and the covenant uh, coming out of them. A covenant structured in violence and steeped in blood from the blood of circumcision and endless animal slaughter to brutal extermination of the people of the land. And so the, the poem that I wrote, uh, sort of meditating on that, uh, is called Meditation from Muddy Woods and with Muddy Woods and Swinging Bridge. And again, it's set sort of out in the country uh, near Bluffton. Hot wind from the west, trail still soft after a whole week's drying. Deer tracks, coon, one stubborn mud hiker's deep scours, each like a little boat or a long wet nest. Wood piled everywhere, neat rows for wood stoves, heaps of trash and branches. We were in Salzburg when a great storm scattered the old trees on the Kapuzinerberg like pickup sticks. 
Today I brought nothing but pens, keys, notebook, comb, bicycle, lock, wallet, and credit cards. And knees a big black fly seems to like, and shorts with a pocket ripped two summers ago, still not fixed. Morning reading. What kind of God would drown every little thing, every living thing that wouldn't fit on some puny ark, would slaughter the people of Canaan for the sake of one hungry band of nomads? Many good gravel paths lead from the subdivision into the woods, but only the animals use them. Somebody's cutting something hard in a dry swimming pool. Who discovered we could cast our anger at the sky and get it back named God? In my old house, the bathroom sink plugs up every four months, but I know exactly how to swear and clear it. Small white blooms all over the multi-floor rows, bushes twice my size. Seed pods float in the pond like mothers determined to tan whether or not their children get lost in the bushes. On a day this hot and green, it seems crazy to think that God picks sides. One plank of the swinging bridge is missing, one bowed and soft, and a big lost branch is wedged high between the end posts but I walk across it anyway. So, um, yeah, this next poem, I, I wrote a series of poems uh, a few years ago when I was on a canoe trip in the Boundary Waters up in uh, northern Minnesota. I see somebody nodding. Anybody, who, who's been up there, yeah? They're closing down the, uh, the company, the Wilderness Winds, uh, which, is, which is tragic, but... Uh, we had, a, we had a great trip. Uh, we were out on the water for five days and four nights, and it, um, we saw the sun the whole first day, and then for about four minutes after that. And it rained. It didn't rain all the time, but it was damp a lot. Um, anyway, it was, still, it was still a fine trip. And uh, this poem, I wrote a series of these poems, in, which are sort of in the middle of the book, and they all have the t contemplation in the title. And this is contemplation on rules and lines, and it, and it starts with... Uh, something that I adopted from William Blake, who, who wrote, uh, One law for the lion and the ox is oppression. Yeah. Which I, I, I'm still pondering. One law for lion and ox is oppression, but of which one? The ghost of William Blake, gnarled and smiling in the hollow between tree and stone, refuses to say. One law for water and rock is precision. Wherever they meet, water does all the talking. Another law is rubbing. Another can be spoken clearly only in loon. Another takes 300 earth years to state in full. A lost fish line dangles like a strand of the golden thread, left behind by a traveler who went home with nothing but bug bites and a solid case of jock itch. I'm not so careful myself, but I wish I were, and I tell myself that counts for something. The wind's law is this, be yourself and I will show you what that is. The water's law is this, tell me anything, only my face will answer. I will hold the little ones in their little boats. I will let them go where they choose if they have the strength. I will tell them what they must know, even if it breaks their backs or their hearts. I will tell them what they want to know, only if they ask very softly and more than once. So you can see that in these poems, I'm sort of uh, not exactly quarreling, but uh, you know, playing around, sometimes resisting, sometimes thinking along with, with people. Uh, another example of that, a different kind of uh, situation, uh, I was on this workshop, and the, we got these, these instructions from the, the guy who was running it, and we were supposed to sit down. Uh, we were out in the woods uh, in eastern Ohio and uh, write the, the, the song of that place or the myth of the place, you know, which, which seemed to me kind of like a ridiculous, how am I going to do that, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And so I, uh, this poem, as you will see, uh, begins with my trying to disobey those instructions 
And then I sort of ended up doing it anyway, you know, which is one of the interesting things. Often, I, I give students these assignments in my writing classes, and uh, sometimes they'll come back and say, well, I didn't really follow your instructions, you know, which sometimes is, is a problem. Uh, but if, if it's a matter of finding something interesting to do that I didn't think of, you know, uh, my response is usually, oh, excellent, you know. Yeah, you found a way to disobey me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's not such a bad thing. The, the, yeah, the trick is to figure out how to do that without just being lazy or stupid, you know, of course. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is also sometimes possible, right? And, and many of us have engaged in that from time to time. Yeah? Okay, so this poem is called Something the Winter Wren uh, Didn't Say. It's also, the, I think, the, probably the sexiest poem in the book. So wait for that, wait for that. Any place to sit will do, because I aim to disobey, to disappear, to wait and listen till the hard earth shudders open like a touch-me-not. Rocks like spilled treasure waiting for the dragon, like junker cars roll downhill toward the crusher, like science waiting for fiction. Whose idea was it anyway to wait so long to let all this accumulate? The tanager and the winter wren both want to sleep, but neither is willing to give up the last word. I'm more like the rocks. I've slept for centuries, but I remember now. After a hundred good nights, our lover the moon got bored and nudged this corner down, roughed things up to mark her place just in case and went away. She hasn't come close to us since. We made many low songs, almost as sweet as the wrens and the tanagers, desperate to lure her back, but we see her roaming through the wild sky and know she's seeing that bully sun, letting him drive his hot car a million miles an hour with no seat belt, parking in a black hole and spreading wide for him, riding him until she glows so white and wet the world cracks and bellows and the rain pours down to turn our rage to tears. I don't know where that came from. It was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, if, if you're lucky, that happens sometimes, you know. Well, I want to read a few poems from this uh, brand new book called Abandoned Homeland. And, and I'll read a couple from, uh, there are a bunch of poems about teaching and about being in classrooms and so forth in, in this, and, uh, which is how I spent, of course, a large part of my life. And, and this first one is, uh, you know, I mean, you students, you all have days when you just feel like kind of getting up and walking out of the room and just leaving it all behind, right? Has anybody ever felt that way? Yeah, okay. I've got, got a few hands, yeah, and the rest of you are laying low lest your professors are close by. And, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I could ask the professors the same question, but I will confess since I'm not from here, you know, and I, I can say that uh, I feel the same way some days, you know. And uh, so this poem is kind of about that. It's called Cookies, and it's, it's related to a Pablo Neruda poem that, that I sort of model this on a little bit. I'm tired of being respectable and professional. For too long, I've gone into classrooms and bathrooms and churches, smiling and brittle as a garden gnome or a homecoming queen waving to the cold bystanders. The aura of solid houses makes my insides quiver. I want to walk into every one, houses I've passed by for 20 years and never entered. I want to sit in the big recliners, steal cookies from the jars on kitchen counters, riffle through magazines, check in medicine cabinets and under beds for scandalous revelations. I'm tired of being available and polite. I'm ready to be invisible, grouchy, and stupid. I'm ready to stand up in the middle of the meeting and scratch myself on the way out the door. <laughs> I'm ready to bring my guitar to class, sit up between the students and the door, play every song I've ever played, every song I can remember without explanation or apology, whether or not I remember the chords or can hit the high notes. Luai, luai, kumbaya. All nine verses have stuck inside a mobile with the Memphis blues again. I know all nine verses, believe me. I'm ready to be a bad wizard, to change morons into moonshine,
dutiful drudges into parsley, solid citizens into corvettes and cotton mouths. I'm ready to fill up with gas on the way out of town and stick to the township roads so narrow that somebody has to take the shoulder. To drive a wide spiral until I find God or Lake Erie or the providential, proverbial, preverbal Mississippi so low now I can barrel right across it with barely a splash or a slither and sail on into the blue gold American night. Okay, another, another one of these. Uh, yeah. Okay, here it is. Uh, 50 billion planets. I have a, a slide on this one with some uh, help. Some of you may know about this famous interchange that Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway had. Uh, Fitzgerald said, the very rich are different from you and me. And Hemingway famously responded, yes, they have more money. <laughs> yeah, OK, that, so that, that is in this poem. And also, you've, you've heard of Marie Antoinette uh, and her famous saying, let, let them eat cake. Uh, she comes into this poem, too. This, this is sort of a, of a, this did not actually happen in my class, but it, it might have, right? right? So it's called 50 Billion Planets. Hemingway was wrong about the very rich, and when he walked into my nonfiction class, I told him so. He wanted to punch me, but I told him all physical violence on campus was prohibited by the peaceful Menno Code, so he just glared and stomped out the door. The code also prohibits gloating, so I asked the students what we'd learned. You blew our chance to talk to a famous dead guy, said the smart kid. And a rich one, said Melinda, who never said anything. Yeah, but rich people aren't like you and me, I answered weakly. You mean they don't attach lame adverbs to their speech tags, said the smart kid. I opened my mouth to tell him off graciously within the guidelines of the peaceful Menno Code. But just then the door opened and a sweet voice said, Qui mangeant de la brioche? Forgive my French. I was baffled, but the code requires unconditional intercultural affirmation. So I smiled and nodded. The woman sashayed towards me, glittering as she walked. Fifty billion Earth-like planets in the galaxy, and there she was, a golden liquid comet on a collision course with my poor sinful Earth. She circled me twice, and then she was more like a hawk pondering whether it was worth the effort to swoop down and snatch a meadow vole. The students were spellbound. Hemingway was forgotten. Everyone thinks, you said, let them eat cake, I muttered. Everyone in your stupid country, maybe, she answered, as if the whole world speaks your silly language. She slid a finger from my ear to my chin, and I shivered, but then she turned to the class, and she was not at all a vain, dead queen. There are 50 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way, she said. How will you spend your small, strange, unrepeatable life? I don't know where that question came from either. <laughs> uh, I'll read one more from this book. This is the, the title poem, and uh, it's got several things in it. It's got uh, uh, a reference to, uh, there's sort of a reference to Camp Friedenswald in, in Michigan, which was the church camp where I went, where my kids went, and a long history of uh, connection with the, the, the mosquito hollow there. And, and my Uncle Jim, who was here last night, actually lives in Burton, Kansas, been there for a long time, uh, also makes an appearance near the end of this poem. Um, he's, he's not treated terribly kindly in this poem, but I want to say here that I really love my Uncle Jim, so, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, he's been a, he was a preacher in Burton for, for a long time. Uh, it's called Abandoned Homeland of Exiles. How else to describe this absurd, lovely world? And yet the trees stir themselves into the humid air, take the weather as it comes. Maybe it'll kill them, but not today. Praise for the mutilated planet is insufficient, but essential. I'm all in favor of grief, mercy, and language, but what kind of meal do they make? Whose children will they save from minimum wage or the poverty draft? Still, it's the season when, despite all my moans and whines, the rooms fill up with strange and lovely faces, and we revel in the happy weariness of learning names, explaining badly, bearing our loads of ill-defined matter and impractical passion, like sticks and tinder, 
for the illegal fire we hope to burn when we find that lost hollow. The clearing with three rows of skinned logs for seating, fire ring, blackened kettle. Yes, the trail's overgrown, root rough. Yes, there might be snakes. Yes, mosquitoes for sure. Wear jeans and socks. Bring the guitars, the song sheets. Uncle Jim will say something genial, solid, and a little awkward. We'll, yeah, okay. we'll sing and sway, praise each other, and walk back in the dark, holding hands. Then we'll gather what we need and head off again for good. The exit doors will open if we push and wait and push again. Let the alarm bells blaze. They'll stop us, but they'll have to let us go. So I'll read a, a few more poems. Uh, next one, uh, how many of you know the name of William Stafford? He was a poet, a uh, number of you do, with a lot of Kansas connections. He lived in Hutchinson for a while and other small towns around campus, uh, around Kansas. Um, he was a conscientious objector in World War II, uh, went and did graduate work after that. The story goes, and I can't remember where I got this story, but I think I may have gotten it directly from him, that when he was looking for work, he was actually offered a job by Bethel College, and he was offered a job at Lewis and Clark College in Oregon. And he was tempted to come back to Kansas, you know, uh, home territory and all that, but the other job paid twice as much. <laughs> so. So the faculty members are laughing, you know. They, they know this is still how it is, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Bethel lost out. Um, but here, here's one thing that Stafford said uh, among many things. And he was a, he was a wonderful poet and a, and a wise man in many ways. In a world like the one we face where in opposition it has to be caught in a world center of power, we scramble for footing, but we're a loyal opposition for our concern happens to be people, and there are no enemies. Redemption comes with care. In our culture, we can oppose but not subvert. Openness is part of our technique. So I'd love to have like two more hours to unpack some of his ideas with you, but since I don't, uh, I will just leave that. And this poem that I want to read begins with an epigraph from uh, Stafford's work that I heard as part of another workshop uh, a little while back, and it, has, it doesn't have that much to do with his ideas about pacifism and activism and so forth, but this line is, the burning city of my sorrow, okay? And so we were given a number of these lines and, and told to pick one and write a poem kind of starting from it, and my first thought when I heard this line was, man, that's melodramatic and sentimental, the burning city of my sorrow, you know? Um, and, and so I, I wrote a poem that is kind of begins as resistance to that line. And then again, this strange thing happened. This old man came into this poem, and uh, he, he just took it over. So you'll see where it goes. The poem's called Interior Housekeeping. My sorrow is not a city and not burning. It is railroad street in my town, so small, it has only six houses, all facing the tracks, three of them neat and clean, two in need of paint and shingles, one so poor that nobody remembers how to open the door, how long ago the gas was turned off, what dwells and swells inside the dark refrigerator. Maybe there's an old man in the bedroom upstairs drinking from the rusty sink tap eating stale corn chips and Oreos. His wife left a note, but it fell behind the stove. He took what he could find upstairs a week ago, knowing this was his last trip. He pared mold off the last wedge of cheese with a table knife, then tried it on his arm. Twice he heard the phone ring, the second time for an hour. He remembered to put the cat outside. He ripped the bag of food right down, filled the water dish, he locked the doors. The sheets have flowers on them. The blanket is wool. A family of squirrels is living in the wall near the chimney. They scratch and chitter all night. He scratches back. 
we did have squirrels in the walls of our house uh, for, for a little while. Uh, my sons, who were, who were little then, kept telling me, Daddy, there's something going on in there. I kept saying, oh, no, no, just go to sleep, just go to sleep. You know how, how there are these problems that you, you, you desperately think that if you just deny them, they won't exist? Uh, yeah. uh, finally, we had to get the squirrels out, which, which we did. It took a while. Uh, I also want to give a, a shout out today to my good friend Keith Ratzliff, who is an illustrious alum of uh, Bethel College and uh, never tires of reminding me of that, at least. And um, Keith lives in uh, Iowa and teaches at Central College, has for a long time. But this is, this is just a snatch from one of his poems called Ending in O, and this is the ending of the poem. And you say, oh, then, oh. Now, now at one time, uh, Keith had a book of poems coming out, and he wanted to call it O. And he asked us what he thought. Um, we thought some, some of his friends were gathered together, and we all said, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, it's a good poem, but it's a terrible title for a book of poems. Oh, 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 oh. All right. So he called the book something else, uh, and it's a great book of poems. But um, I decided once that I should write a poem called Oh. And so here it is. And it's dedicated to Keith. And it's set on the, uh, on, in, in Canada. Uh, we have good friends who live in one of the islands out in the, in the bay between uh, Vancouver proper and uh, Vancouver Island. So it's on one of these islands, kind of looking on the beach, looking around from there. Rocks like Jeffers described, hard-headed, stiff-witted, but not chatterers or fools. Not easy to walk on them, but not dull either. East, the mainland is lost in murk and haze. West, the last sun tints a few tentative clouds. Yesterday, I read Robert Haas's account of the difference between O, O-H, and O, O, which was offered with complete confidence and matched my own views, not at all. The heat is supposed to break tomorrow. A family of otters prowls just offshore, looking for dinner, staying close. The low thrum of the freighters never quite stops. How many steps between vast calm and total panic? When I say O, oh, I mean O, oh, if Bob Haas is around. If Ratzliff is around, I don't know what I mean. I couldn't hear the freighters at first, and now I can't stop listening. This long rock, like an enormous baguette gone stale, like a fossil finger pointed toward Bellingham or Blaine or Mount Baker, like the colored pencil God threw down when it was time to quit on the shoreline and make some seals and gulls and crabs. And now the cloud bank over white rock has burst into color. Another few miles is nothing for the sun. And the little people lights hug the skin of the world like God knows what, like fireflies or deer eyes on the road, like embers of a fire left to burn out on a windy afternoon. No rain for weeks, the forest so dry. Oh, the arbutus leaves rustling. Oh, oh. So I've got, I've got, yeah, uh, I'll read well, just one more poem. Uh, this is the uh, title poem. Wait, okay, there we go. Oh, you're not supposed to see that yet. Oh, 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 okay, yeah, if you got a glimpse, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, this, is, this is the title poem of a uh, book, Somewhere Near Defiance. It took me a long time to write this poem, and I was trying to do, you know, uh, to write some kind of a poem that would deal with, uh, in some way, the sort of political situation of, uh, you know, the United States in the early 21st century, which is very weird in any number of ways. And uh, a little bit of background. The Defiance is a town uh, nearby, about 40 miles from where I live. Uh, there was a fort there uh, for a number of years. The fort was founded by General... Anthony Wayne, sometimes called Mad Anthony Wayne. Uh, Fort Wayne is also named after him. And uh, before that, there was a Native American village there. And some of that's described in the poem. Uh, it also has Washington, D.C. in it, and a trip I made there. And uh, a little bit about Walt Whitman, and a little bit about teaching, and yeah, all this stuff sort of mashed together. So somewhere near defiance. I live near Defiance, a white name pressed on an old place. 
Mad Anthony Wayne's soldiers broke down the orchards when the battle was theirs and built a fort where the Auglaise and Maumee rivers meet. Water will answer anything, the moon, the wind, the mud. The rivers mingle and move on. Once I drove my little car right into the heart of the empire, huddled with my friends to plot and complain. All over town, the poets and other malcontents were hiding in the open, vowing to split the rocks and terrify the despots. In the coffee house, we tallied our losses and wondered how to subvert the lyric eye until the hot waitress grabbed the mic to say that racism, racism wasn't over yet. We clapped for her, then wandered toward the Capitol, launched some ragged words to each other and the wind. All right, you can have shock, we told the adversary, but awe belongs to us. Walt Whitman thought his poems might stop the war. When they didn't, he moved to Washington, took a day job so he could go to the field hospitals, read to the wounded, write letters for men with no arms or eyes. I have been hurt, but am mending well. Do not weep, I will find you one day. I walked around for days, found no field hospitals, lots of monuments. I passed the suited and booted, the shaggy and lame, the proud and weary, and it seemed that each of us carried a wound we were trying to hide. Meanwhile, the drone pilots turned their hellfires loose from dark rooms in the suburbs by a six-pack on the way home. 1,200 veterans of the last good war die each day, and the stools at the VFW stand like puzzled mushrooms. These days, I wake up grateful that my heavy dreams are gone. I snag the zipper of my coat, pull it free, and walk off puzzling over slides and words and stratagems. Then I step into a room and see a row of faces, hopeful and new as yellow apples, hanging in the orchards of defiance. The morning came brilliant to my quiet town, sun and the junipers, a robin on the wire. Nothing that I do matters to the earth or the sky. But I've stalled around too long. It's time for declarations, time for floods, time to put down the Toledo blade and take a very long walk. Time to say peace on terror, peace on drugs, peace on defiance. Peace on Mad Anthony and his soldiers, gone so quiet now, and the warriors they fought and the fruit trees they tore. The Auglaise and the Maumee join and drift on, exchanging sticks and soil and bits of news. We are in the earth already, and the earth in us. Even from defiance, nothing's more than half a world away. Well, thank you very much. So I, I think we have, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Do, do I have volunteers to run the mics? Oh, thanks. You can ask me anything about the poems, about where they come from, about writing. Uh, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever you'd like. so much for coming. Um, I was just wondering, when did you get into writing? Like, how old were you whenever you started writing poetry? Now, I, I really didn't start till I was in college. My first year in college, I was telling Mark this story the other night. Um, you know, I was away from home for the first time and kind of lonely, and uh, I met this woman. She was from Virginia. She was this uh, small person with long, dark hair, and I thought she was really special, and she thought I was really not. Uh, you know how that goes? I, I don't know if anybody here has ever had that experience. Yeah, yeah, we've all had that experience. So uh, one day I just found myself going over to the bookstore and buying a brown notebook and starting to write, you know, unrequited love poems in it. Those were the first things. The second things were poems in which I discovered that war was a bad thing and we shouldn't do it anymore. You know, that, So those are usually the two things that, often the two things that people start with. Um, eventually I realized that you know, there might be other subjects. I kind of got over her. She married a soccer player and that was all. That was okay. He was a nice guy. Um, I found somebody else. Yeah, um, But I kept writing. Yeah, And so I think people start in all kinds of different ways, but that's, that's my story. Yeah. 
something else. I have a question. Um, I was wondering what's your opinion as an author on how people interpret your, your work. Do you ever feel like there's a wrong interpretation or do you feel like maybe sometimes people see things that you never even thought of in terms of when you were writing the poem? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, you know, in theory, yeah, there are wrong, inter I mean, you know, it's not all interpretations are created equal. And, but I, I think, and I always tell my students this, that, that ones that actually respect what is in the text are, you know, there's a lot of room. And, and it's happened many times that people uh, talk about my poems in ways that I hadn't thought of. You know, I mean, you, as you write, you're conscious of some things. You know, you're aware of some things that you're trying to do, but there are a lot of other things that are just kind of halfway present in your conscious mind. And and actually, I I often think that the best poems come when you're not aware of everything that you're doing. You know, and, and in my classes, I often try to get students to stop being so self-aware as they're writing and try to just get lost in the words and the language and so forth. And so, yeah, you know, people come up with things that I hadn't thought of and a lot of times I say, oh, that's cool, you know. Um, sometimes I say, oh, that's horrifying, but it might be true, you know, too. So, yeah, yeah. yeah something else. Hi. Um, are you related to Nate Gundy, by chance? <laughs> yeah, Nate's, Nate's my number one son. Okay, Absolutely. well, he was one of my camp counselors at Freedom's World. Oh, so interesting okay. Connection. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Mennonite game right here between the podium and the... Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks for coming. I... Um, I was just curious, it sounds like you've lived in, in several different parts of the country, and, and um, I was curious how um, landscape and nature and geography of where you're living at the time um, impacts your, your writing. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, yeah, I grew up in central Illinois. I went to Goshen for college, was there for five or six years, worked for a year, went to IU then to grad school in southern Indiana. Then I was in Heston for four years, and ever since I've mostly lived in in Bluffton in Northwest Ohio, although we did do like sabbatical leaves, one in Salzburg and one in, in Lithuania recently. So I have mean, lived a number of different places. And, and I would say wherever I go, I find myself really uh, getting caught up in the particular landscapes and, and trying to write things that, you know, inhabit those places, you know? I mean, and uh, not, not all poets are like that. Some write what they write wherever they are and never seem to notice what's, what's around them. And that's, you know, some of those people are great writers. But, but I've always found that a lot of my work is really embedded in particular places, as you could tell from the poems that I wrote. So, yeah, I mean, I, I like having all that stuff in there. And I like having these different layers. You know, often there's the landscape and there's this heady stuff that I've been brooding about and there's what's for supper and, you know. So, so when, when those more than one thing sort of cross in the poem. Often that's where the energy of it comes from, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question would be, uh, what would be your number one, or the first thing off the top of your head, advice for someone <coughs> beginning to write poetry? Ah, read a whole lot, yeah. And that's what everybody says, but it's true. Uh, you need to read, you need to pay attention to other people, uh, the, the world around you, absorb as much as you can, write a lot, find a group of people that you can share your work with, and try to be patient about it. You know, don't, don't expect that you're going to write the best poem of your life when you're, when you're 19 or 20 years old. You know, I mean, it, it takes a while to learn the craft. You know? John Keats was an exception, but, but most people aren't like John Keats. Yeah? So, um, yeah, that's... That's the quick answer since we're almost out of time. 